Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are beginning with the second uh, inequality debate uh, today. UNDP Pakistan has launched the National Human Development Report titled The Three P's of Inequality, Power, People, and Policy. The three themes are the key drivers of inequality in the country and focusing on inequality from a national and regional perspective. The report was launched earlier in April in the presence of the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan. To amplify and disseminate the messages of the report, we have been conducting national and provincial uh, seminars, webinars, debates, and discussion sessions. Today's session is the third, uh, the second session, uh, the, uh, the national session on the inequality debate. The first one was held earlier on 13th of July, where we discussed uh, people as a driver of inequality. And today, we are talking about policies as the key driver of inequality. We have with us a very distinguished panelist panel, panel with us. Uh, and moderating that panel is Musharraf Zedi Saab, who needs no introduction. But Musharraf Saab is a CEO and senior fellow at Tabat Lab. He's a public policy professional with two decades of experience in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and South Asian region. He's a leading columnist, diplomat, and government advisor. He writes weekly in newspapers and has been an advisor to Ministry of Foreign Affairs earlier. So he will be facilitating us in taking through the session. We'll begin the session with a brief uh, welcome remarks from Mr. Kanut Osbe, the resident representative for UNDP in Pakistan, followed by uh, uh, welcome remarks by Dr. Sania Nishta. And then we'll have a presentation by our lead author, Dr. Hafiz Pasha, followed by the panel discussion moderated by Musharraf Zaidi Saab. So, Kanut, with your kind permission, if you can just start with the welcome, welcome remarks. Thank you so much. I'm uh, I'm very privileged to to be here with all of you to continue the discussion around the UNDP Pakistan's uh, National Human Development Report on the three P's of inequality: power, people, and policy. And I thank you very much to all of all of you for for being with us today. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Her Excellency Dr. Sanya Nishtar for her keen interest in the uh, NHR 2020 messages of inclusion as well, as well as inequality reduction. I would also like to thank very much Dr. Hafiz Pasha for his uh, uh, authorship as well as his continued engagement with UDP on the dissemination of this, uh, uh, these results, uh, these uh, outcomes from the NHR 2020. My sincere gratitude also to the esteemed panel members who have taken out time to contribute to our second webinar in UDP Pakistan's inequality debate. The first of these webinar ex uh, webinars explored how people, the people dimension drives inequality in the country. And the webinar today will focus on the second P of inequality in NHDR uh, and it's entitled policy as a driver of inequality centering people for inclusive policy. Uh, for a while now, inequality has been at the forefront of the policy debate, leaving no one behind is the rallying cry uh, of the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. And um, it's an important promise of the Sustainable Development Goals that we are committed to achieving by 2030. So what is the nature of inequality in Pakistan, we ask? The NHDR 2020 notes the huge disparities in the country along different axes, such as income, gender, geography, and more. According to the report, the richest 20% of the Pakistan population has almost 50% of the country's income, while the poorest 20% uh, only has 7% of the income. At the same time, human development measured for the richest group stands high at almost 0.7, while for the poorest, it is low at just above 0.4. At the launch of the Pakistan National Human Development Report in April this year, the Honorable Prime Minister Imran Khan said that a civilized society is defined by the way it looks after its weakest section of the population. And how can we do this? One of the immediate answers to this question is good policies. A government's policy determines the kind of country it wants to create. This can be answered by asking questions like, 
Does the government provide cash benefits to offset poverty? Does it privilege health services during crisis to maintain physical and mental well-being? Is it investing in education and training to enable young people to live independently and participate fully in economic, social, and, and cultural life? In this context, policy as a driver of inequality in the NHGR 2020 refers to systems and strategies that are either currently ineffective or at odds with the principles of social justice. To this end, the report lays out a policy blueprint that can put the country on the road to a more equal Pakistan. That includes uh, reducing privileges of the country's elite groups, improving conditions of work, providing employment, and lastly, but not least, spending more on human development and social protection. For Pakistan, as in other parts of the world, uh, the latter point has emerged as an even more pronounced need in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, uh, as, as we've seen, Pakistan has done relatively well in, uh, in terms of a social protection response to COVID-19. But of course, there's always more that can be done. At the end, I would like to stay, state that I'm thankful to, for, to everyone present here today. Uh, to continue the dialogue among the teams of this NHGR 2020. Uh, we would like to reiterate our support to the government and to the country in achieving um, in equality reduction and social protection to ensure we leave no one behind. Thank you very much. Mr. Saab, over to you to moderate and call in Dr. Sanya and at the time. Thank you, Omar, and uh, thanks very much to the UNDP country team who's worked immensely hard. Uh, obviously, the labor of uh, Dr. Pasha's uh, intellectual and research uh, efforts and rigor um, is something that we all have benefited from for many, many years. But this is uh, an especially important document, and I think an important moment for Pakistan to be talking about this. And I think for uh, us to be privileged uh, by the presence of uh, Dr. Sanya Nishtar uh, to open this conversation, I think is particularly poignant and important. Uh, without much further ado and without a very long formal introduction, I don't think Dr. Sanya Nishtar um, is in requirement of, of an introduction, but I will say that the efforts uh, of the government of Pakistan over the last two and a half years, almost three years uh, since uh, this government came in to consolidate existing social protection instruments and to build on them uh, has been nothing short of uh, very, very impressive, particularly in light of the SS uh, emergency cash program. Um, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to uh, welcome her and ask her to open the conversation. And we'll follow that up by a presentation by Dr. Afiz Pasha, followed by the panel discussion. Dr. Sanya Nishtar. Uh, well, um... Good, good day, uh, good, good morning, uh, assalamu alaikum. Um, let me, allow me to begin by congratulating the UNDP, Kunat, and Hafiz Pasha Saab for a, for a very important publication. I've had the privilege of uh, having a sneak preview. I've had the privilege of being at the table when this report was being launched by the prime minister. And then subsequently I've, uh, it's it's on my priority reading pack. I read relevant sections uh, as 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 and when the, the need arises. So I think I cannot overemphasize its importance. But the journey that you are embarking on now is even more important than the publication of the report. Uh, like many of you, I'm uh, I was a researcher once, and as a researcher, when you produce a publication and you see the galleys, you think that you're work is done. And that is when you put the files away, archive the files and you tell yourself the work is done, the, the, the paper is published, the monograph is published. But as a policymaker, we all know that the work begins only then. If you do not adequately disseminate what you write, what you research, what you produce, you do not get the desired impact from that. Uh, so the journey that you're embarking on today in terms of the dissemination of this report, I hope is going to have a very wide ranging footprint. And if there's any assistance you require from the government in whatever little capacity I can support, 
I will go all out for that because it is absolutely imperative that right down to the Tessil level, right down to the last mile of the government, right down to the last subnational level, decision makers understand what this report means, what equality denotes, uh, and they understand well the policy implications in terms of measurement, in terms of metrics, in terms of uh, new frameworks, in terms of accountability. So just to reiterate that the journey you're embarking upon is, is very, very uh, important. Now, I was excited to join this, uh, this, this webinar, not because I have to make opening remarks, because, but because I wanted to listen to all of you. Unfortunately, I have been called to the Senate Standing Committee on Poverty Eradication at 11 a.m. Uh, so I must apologize in advance because I will have to step out. Uh, but I hope that, uh, that this event is being recorded. And if it is being recorded, Umar Malik, I would really appreciate a recording so that I can go through, uh, th through the proceedings because I think what you have to say about the report and what you have to say in terms of um, in terms of outlining the recommendation of the way forward is something that I can uh, carry back to the to the cabinet. Uh, I, I would, in terms of the report and what its pitch is and what its tone is and what its contents are, uh, if, um, if you allow me to be a bit self-reflective at this point, in 2017, I was one of the three finalists uh, for WHO Director General. And I recall the evening where I was preparing my speech uh, of, for the next day where the final vote was to take place. Um, and, and I was struggling with what I was going to say. Uh, so I said right up front, I said, look, UN entities have different functions. Uh, one of the functions of a UN entity is to be the world's parliament for, for the sector. So WHO is the world's parliament for the, for the health ministry and different ILO is the world's parliament for the labor ministry. And likewise, UNDP is the world's parliament for, uh, for, 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 for a wide range of sectors. And that's one, that's one mandate of a UN entity. The other mandate of a UN entity is to be the technical lighthouse. Uh, you have footprint in every country. You, you have knowledge and experience and you have experts. Your third function is to support ministries so you work hand in hand with the government, but a very important function of the UN entities is also to be the world's conscience, to be an honest voice. And because you are an honest voice and you're the world's conscience, you also have a responsibility to say what is right. And a lot of times I said on the floor that day, uh, a lot of times these, these mandates conflict with each other. You have to work with governments, but on the other hand, you also have to be an, an honest broker. Uh, the reason why I'm being a bit self-reflective and recalling that experience is because I see you fulfilling that very rare mandate, that, that mandate which I see being fulfilled very rarely, the, the, the contents of the report, how daring it was, the, the in-depth analysis on which you based your, uh, your, your key findings, the, the recommendations. Um, were clearly reflective of that fourth mandate that which, which we see being fulfilled rarely. So it's a long winded way of saying, I, uh, I enormously respect uh, what, what you've come up with. Now it's key findings are in the public domain. We know that um, Pakistan faces high income and wealth inequality. Uh, and we also know that where one lives in Pakistan crucially determines one, one's life outcomes. Um, now, in terms, of, in terms of how you address this disparity, uh, there are wide ramifications into every conceivable area of public policy, uh, which is why the importance of dissemination, the importance of dissemination with, gra with, with, uh, with granularity, with a commentary uh, that, that goes into granularity. But in terms of social protection, I think we will all agree, and as Punut also outlined in his framing comments, there's a huge interplay of social protection. And to that effect, I can, uh, I can assure you that the government is taking this very seriously. There is a long road ahead. 
Um, there is a very wide agenda uh, and we are working on every front um, with, with sincerity. Now this fiscal year is very important for us because the new SR survey is being completed based on which uh, a range of new programs will be upscaled nationwide for 14 different target groups. We have worked very hard over the last 33 months. Uh, and in addition to the survey, we have pursued a very aggressive reform agenda. Yeah, a publication around that is going to be in the unveiled very soon. We have completed phase one of the SAS BRI. Uh, the BRI is an acronym for the Building and Rebuilding Institutions Initiative, uh, which, which is a very wide ranging agenda. This is this aspect of SAS that nobody sees. Um, the 10 foundations on which we base our programs. We've worked very aggressively on all of those. We fast track deployment and uh, we have upscale new pro uh, existing programs uh, that have undergone mass massive reform and we have put in place new initiatives, new programs. And we have done all this in tandem with uh, the execution of a SaaS emergency cash uh, where we reached out to almost 40% of the country's population. So what was visible over the last year and a half was a SAS emergency cash, but in the backdrop of that, the BRI was ongoing, the 10 foundations were being built, the new programs were being conceptualized um, according to rules, procedures, and, and processes. So in terms of what we will do this year, in this fiscal year, we will cover 1 million families under SAS Kafalat. This will be the highest number of families ever covered in the country are getting regular support. Uh, this month, the Prime Minister will formally open the SR school stipends program. So every child from an SR eligible family from age 4 to 22 will have an opportunity to get an SR stipend. And you'll be very pleased to know that the stipends, the structure of the stipend is such that it is heavily skewed towards girls. So across all Across all the age dimensions, girl get, girls get a higher stipend compared, uh, compared to boys. Um, we expect to cover 5 million uh, students this year in this program. In terms of SAS and the graduate scholarship, which was a new program, our government had promised 200,000 scholarships over four years, launched two years ago. We had already oversubscribed. In the last two years, we gave 142,000 undergraduate scholarships, and we'll be reworking our target upwards uh, this year. So between SAS school stipends and the SAS undergraduate scholarship, we have coverage for students from all SAS families across the life course. Uh, and repeating myself, the, these programs are heavily skewed in favor of girls and women. In the last two years, we also rolled out SAS Nashunama, which is a new program. Uh, we rolled it out in 14 districts, the most underprivileged districts across the country. This is a program to address stunting, a conditional cash transfer program to address stunting and malnutrition using specialized nutrition food. The initial results are very encouraging based on which we are scaling it uh, na nationwide. An outcomes evaluation is also embedded into the design of this uh, program. Over the last three years, we've been working intensively on uh, the SAS one window operations. This is a complex execution with different dimensions, the policy integration dimension, data integration dimension, the back office integration dimension, the, the, the front end one window centers, the digital apps that accompany the digital platforms that consolidate information. The first one window center was deployed in Satara market. We have good operational insights. The process evaluation results are very encouraging. Our SAS Digital is now in the public domain for the last two weeks, being deployed, be, being tweaked. A first iteration of the app is being launched. It's been expanded to uh, cover the comprehensive, um, uh, to, to, to cover the entire gamut of the information and services. The backend integration of a very complex nature is ongoing. So we will be, uh, we will be launching the SAS National Data Exchange Portal this year. And we have committed to opening SAS one window centers in every uh, district of the country in this fiscal year, and then in every tehsil in the next fiscal year. Uh, standing invitation to anybody who would like to visit the first one window center, I would like to take you there personally. 
In terms of other national programs, the SRS interest free loan program, we, last year we expanded from 110 to 113 districts. This year we are also expanding SRS Tahafuz nationwide. This is a program you probably have not heard about. We have been very quietly implementing this over the last two years in one hospital. It's a program to promote financial access to healthcare to complement, say, at Sahula. As, as you would have gathered, uh, in one stream, we are we have programs to facilitate financial access to education, and on the in the other stream, this is a program to complement say at Sahula, uh, with financial access to healthcare as an end uh, as an end point. Uh, we also have put in place a number of interesting pilot projects at very small scales, from which we are learning. The Targeted Commodity Subsidies Initiative in partnership with the National Bank of Pakistan, the Targeted Commodity Subsidies Initiative with threads running into SAS at the Utility Stores Corporation, SAS Rady Ban is an interesting, very small pilot to see how we can promote a street vending, the street vending economy in a sustainable manner. And these are all small initiatives uh, which uh, from which we will learn, and then based on evidence, we will see how to take them forward and to expand them. In terms of uh, in terms of other initiatives, the SAS hybrid social insurance scheme um, is also on the anvil this year in terms of pilot deployment, and the SAS digital Hunar program is in the final works in terms of uh, approvals from from the design community. As I mentioned this year, we will also open the National Data Exchange Portal, the Data for Pakistan Portal, the expanded iteration of that. We will open a SAS registration disk in every tehsil, and we are opening a new payment system to facilitate uh, the donation management. So the aspiration is to have a one window of support in SAS for every deserving household, to have a live registry where people can um, register themselves when they require support, to have one window operations where they can be served through a digital interface without human discretion in a transparent way, and to have an ecosystem where citizens can contribute uh, and help the government uh, and, and, and assist the government uh, in our vision for, for a welfare state. These are complex executions, complex multifaceted executions. Uh, with many th threads running, with, with many in tandem work streams. Um, our own work plan is very complex. We follow it on a, on a weekly basis. This is extreme hard work. What you see layered up uh, in the front is just the tip of the iceberg. And the iceberg is a lot of hard work going into multiple, uh, into multiple streams. I cannot claim that we have align the sun, moon, and the stars, but I can assure you that a lot of uh, sincere, dedicated hard work is ongoing across multiple streams. Uh, and, and we hope to have an ecosystem, as I said, where we have live registration systems, where people can go and register themselves, where they have one window digital operations in every they see, where there are dashboards with visibility, of every penny going to every union council and where uh, every department under SRS is ISO certified. Uh, as I said initially, we've completed phase one of BI, SRS BRI, the Building and Rebuilding Institutions Initiatives. The focus of the reform initially was BISP. BISP is one of the executing agencies of SRS. There are many other executing agencies, but because BISP caters to the bulk of a lot of the money flows through it. This was the first focus of our reform. Uh, and in phase two, we will continue to refine the reform, plus take the reform to the other institutional entities. I hope that this is going to be uh, the first interaction of many. Very happy to facilitate the dissemination of your report in, every, in any way that we can help. Uh, good luck to you for the rest of the uh, duration of the webinar. And I look forward to receiving the recording uh, and, and to giving you my feedback on that. Thank you very much. And over back to you, Umar. Thank you, Dr. Sani. I'm sure it's over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Umar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nishtar, for that uh, 
great uh, overview of what is happening um, on the SAS front. Uh, I, without taking up much more time, I think uh, given that there's a shortage of time, I'll just ask Dr. Afis Pasha to jump into uh, his presentation. And maybe uh, Dr. Pasha, I could request you to also open with some thoughts about the place of social protection in the overarching architecture of, of uh, inequality or the fight against inequality, uh, because I think that would make a great segue. Uh, but uh, the floor is now yours, Dr. Afis Pasha. Thank you. Can the host please allow the screen sharing for Dr. Pasha? Start? Okay, <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you for uh, giving us uh, the, uh, the opportunity to speak on uh, the <clears throat> National Human Development Report of 2020. I had the privilege of being the lead author, but let me on record place our deep appreciation of the enormous efforts and the kind of in-depth research which was undertaken by the very strong team that we had put together. And I would like to place on record my appreciation of the eight member team who helped and in fact really made a tremendous contribution to the preparation of the National Human Development Report. I will, of course, cover this issue of social protection and because that is one of the <clears throat> key elements of our policy recommendations. And as required by the moderator, we will inshallah cover that at the latter part of our presentation. Okay, as has already been indicated, the uh, report essentially has three big messages on inequality. The first is the role of power, the groups that exploit loopholes, networks, and political influence for their benefit. The second are the people who in fact may in have some deeply embedded belief systems that encourage bias against particular groups. And the third, the policy part, which is on the strategies and policies that cater more to the interests of the powerful or are just either wrongly designed, weakly implemented, and ineffective. I'd like to, before we go ahead, quote from our constitution, which I and all of us greatly respect as a prime document for guiding Pakistan. The particular paragraph that I wish to quote is Article 38A. Secure the well-being of the people irrespective of sex, caste, creed, or race by raising their standard of living, by preventing the concentration of wealth and means of production and distribution in the hands of a few to the detriment of a general interest and by ensuring equitable adjustment of rights between employer and employees and landlords and tenants. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is such a powerful statement of our national commitment to justice, equality, and a, a country which essentially focuses on ensuring that there is no exploitation in any aspect of our country. The prime minister during his election campaign and even subsequently has often mentioned what he calls the two 
Pakistans or the two different parts of Pakistan. And here I will just highlight to you how really remarkable and large the difference is in incomes among different people living in different parts of our country. If you look at the income extremes, Sindh urban, particularly Karachi, the per capita income is in PPP terms $16,886, which is the same as China. So at least one part of our country has reached the peak in terms of the comparable living standards to China. But unfortunately, you go to the other extreme, which is Balochistan, and you have the bottom quintile in Balochistan with a per capita income, which is hardly 10% of the income of the top quintile or top and the richest component of Pakistan's population. And ladies and gentlemen, in my previous presentation, I had highlighted a finding which had worried me greatly. And I speak with my heart that Balochistan, our brothers, the Baloch brothers, over the last 15 years, there has been no increase in real per capita income in Balochistan. I repeat, no increase in per capita real terms in Balochistan. This is a province which has already got a per capita income, which is almost 30% less than the national average. And there has been no growth. Unfortunately, Balochistan is beginning to look like the soft underbelly of our country. And I'm really very, very reassured that the prime minister has proceeded to announce a special package for Balochistan, particularly in the more underdeveloped districts in the southern part. Inshallah, we hope that this will be executed with a great deal of vigor and that Balochistan will be able to stage its comeback. Believe it or not, 20 years ago, the per capita income of Balochistan was higher than that of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Today, it is much lower. Here is the figure which has been quoted a lot in the media, and that is the share of the richest, uh, the true elite of Pakistan. And I will just give you two or three important indicators. First is property. 16% of the property in terms of value is owned by the top 1% of Pakistan's population. The other striking figure which comes from the agricultural census of 2010 is that 22% of the farm area is owned by only 1% of the large farmers, the farmers. The other numbers are also very, very worrying, bank deposits and so on. So there is evidence clearly that the richest 1% of the population of our country has preempted a disproportionately large share of income and wealth. Here I'll give you an idea of what have been the long-term trends since 1990-91 in inequality. And this is based on a lot of very serious primary research by the team and also on earlier research done by economists like A.R. Kamal and so on. What you see clearly is that between 1991 till the end of the decade, inequality had more or less come down. And one of the reasons why that had happened was significant improvement in agricultural production, although the GDP growth rate was not particularly high. Between 2000 and 2007, 8 there was a very sharp increase in inequality. And this was a period where we saw high growth and then thereafter, there has been some steady decline in incidence of uh, inequality, although consumption spending inequality has increased somewhat. Now, the message which is clear here is that periods of high growth in Pakistan's history have generally run the risk of increasing inequality. 
it is very interesting that there is one period, the decade of the 80s, when we had high growth, but interestingly, inequality declined. And that was again because of the breakthrough in agricultural production, particularly following the commissioning of the Tarbela Dam. So we have to focus not only on high growth, but also on high growth, which is inclusive in character. And that is why the ingredients of the strategy and the policy become extremely important. Let me now turn to the analysis that we have done of the access to privileges by the relatively politically and economically stronger sections of our society and identified, and this really required a lot of primary research. And I must say that the team spent N hours trying to quantify and identify various forms of privilege. The first one, of course, is the more obvious one, which is that particularly because of uh, disproportionate representation in the political process, uh, privileged uh, groups are able to get more tax exemptions, low effective tax rates, and are also evade taxes, and uh, no effort is made to really reduce that evasion. The second type of uh, privilege is favorable pricing formula, and I'll give you some examples as we move later. Higher effective protection, particularly through disproportionately high import tariffs, and of course, the presence of monopolies and cartels, which have increasingly come under discussion over the last three, four years, particularly in the context of markets for essential commodities. So this has become a very, very focused area in terms of behavior. Then we have cheaper inputs, energy, water, to particular sectors or segments, cheaper intermediate inputs, and of course, access to missionary, either subsidized through fiscal incentives or through import duty exemptions. And a very, very important part of the privilege, which is not emphasized so much. My One of the lessons I've learned from this research is that one of the key, key sources of privilege and access to wealth is land, land, land. The struggle con constantly is for access to more and cheaper land. Then of course, there is differential access to capital, particularly between large and SMEs and so on in the context of bank credit. And of course, there is also differential in access to infrastructure and services. We have looked at each one of these, and it took us weeks to quantify each one of them. And we have tried our very best to be on the conservative side in the estimation of the value or the quantum of these privileges. The end result after months of work by the team is that clearly as expected, the corporate sector as is, is, uh, generally has the highest quantum of privilege, and that is particularly in the case of the tax treatment and also in terms of access to <laughs> credit and other inputs. 724 billion in 2017-18 was the value of privileges. This, by the way, includes the enormous privilege we are giving to the independent power producers in the power sector. Then the second class, which get, seems to get uh, sizable privileges, is of course the feudal class, clearly disproportionately represented politically. The classic example of the <clears throat> favorable treatment is the <clears throat> extraordinarily low agricultural income tax, which for the country as a whole yields 3 billion rupees when this class owns more than 22% of the farm area. Then we have, of course, high net worth individuals, especially property owners in the urban areas of the country, large traders, state-owned enterprises, who are among the most worrying examples of privilege for these state-owned enterprises has been access to what is known as government-guaranteed debt. This cushions them from any form of pressure 
to reduce costs and generate better and efficiency and better results financially. Today, you'll be amazed the quantum of contingent liabilities or guaranteed debt to the state-owned enterprises has reached over two and a half trillion rupees. This is not the private sector contingent liability or circular debt. This is besides that. So you need to understand that this is the same magnitude as the circular debt in the energy sector. Unfortunately, last year, there was a 27% growth in guaranteed debt to state-owned enterprises, which is now cutting and biting into access to credit by the private sector. And then we have the military establishment where the exercise of privilege is in the nature of participation in economic activities and role particularly in the context of urban development. And finally, we have exporters who do enjoy various benefits like a lower withholding tax, concessional financing, lower industrial tariffs, and so on and so forth. Add all of them up, very carefully, we ended up with an estimate of 2,660 billion rupees in 2017-18. As a percentage of the GDP, if these privileges have mostly remained unchanged, our estimate as of now is that it's worth this quantum of privileges has risen to 3,850 billion rupees in 2021. I mean, this is enormous, almost exactly the amount of tax we have historically collected. Last year we did better, but the 2,660 billion was very close to the tax collection earlier on. So this is the distribution of the privileges among different vested interests or powerful segments of our society and a large number of them have remained unchanged. I mean, for example, if you look at the state-owned enterprises, as I said, they've had access to much more guaranteed debt. Military establishment, very unusual, was given tax exemption on Fort Fauci Foundation and on the Army Welfare Trust. These are two very old standing institutions. It is surprising why tax exemption was given in this ongoing budget. This is a very useful analysis and all thanks to Pakistan <clears throat> standards and living standards measurement survey by the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics. I mean, it's amazing. Even in public services, the differential in access is so pronounced. I'll give you one example. I mean, primary education, one would have thought would be more or less equally accessed. But here you find that uh, the bottom quintile, 41%, and the top quintile, 75% of the children belonging to that quintile. Similarly, if you look at uh, <clears throat> access to tap water, you find almost 30% difference. And in the case of a percent of children immunized, it is absolutely unbelievable. 92% in the top quintile and 38% only in the bottom quintile. I mean, one can understand differential access in private services. But here, the striking finding is in publicly provided services, there is such differential in access. As a result of which we have done a careful analysis of quantifying the benefits to different quintiles of the population. If you look at the first quintile, the total value of benefits from public expenditure is 26,000 rupees per capita. And the tax paid is hardly 3,000 rupees and that's almost entirely naturally indirect taxes. What is surprising is that the gap between, uh, I'm sorry, the benefit is 29,000 and the net benefit is 26,000. It remains more or less the same across the first four quintiles and suddenly, suddenly in the top quintile, you find that the net benefit is as much as 57,000 rupees per quintile. 
per capita. I mean, this is really an indictment of the access to public services. Even here, there is an element of privilege, whereas one would have thought that this concept of equity and balanced provision would be the most important consideration in the provision of public services. This is a, a massive model which was built by me and two of my PhD students, who were, one was at NUST and the other was at PIDE. And we did a model which, for the first time, in fact, in the literature, has explicitly brought together growth and inequality and showed the relationship between growth and inequality. This I did not highlight too much in the report, this model, because it's frankly, technically somewhat in the frontiers. And therefore, it was better that we simply highlight their findings. So one of the more interesting one is less divergence from real effective exchange rate is the policy we are currently following. It's somewhat better for the GDP growth rate, but it leads to an increase in inequality on a net macroeconomic basis. This is a finding which is not generally recognized. The others are somewhat more ob obvious. The other one also is that the faster growth in remittances does help growth but has a strong negative effect on inequality for two reasons. One, it is regionally inequitably distributed in Pakistan. 60% goes to Punjab, 25% goes to KPK, and the remainder about 15% to the other two provinces. And the other important point to note is that home remittances to any family immediately begins to place it either in the top or in the second quintile. So it by definition adds to inequality. Dr. Sab, sorry to interrupt just very quickly. Because we're uh, significantly over time, I've been asked to uh, request if we can wrap up in the next uh, three to four minutes. Oh, well, it's disappointing that we're not even being given half an hour. Uh, for all this work, and we have had presentations for more than half an hour already. Anyway, as instructed, let me conclude with this slide. The three-pronged strategy is recommended as follows. The first is various ways of reducing the privileges of the elite. This has already been referred to by the resident representative. Second, spending more on human development and social protection and three, improving conditions of work, especially for women and achieving more decent work. My last statement on social protection. Yes, it's wonderful that the government is focusing on social protection and, and providing additional support to the poor, but really what you need to do is to have a strategy which reduces first the number of the poor. And there I'm afraid, particularly after COVID-19, the number of poor in Pakistan has gone up by almost 20 million more people. So as per the instructions of the coordinator and the moderator, I'm pleased to conclude my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Saab. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to instruct you. This was, uh, this was a uh, request that was uh, forced upon me by the nature of the um, the nature of the instructions or directives that I myself uh, had gotten in terms of timeliness. Uh, if, if you uh, grant us the privilege of remaining with us, um, perhaps I can come to you at the conclusion of the panel discussion, which we'll try to wrap up earlier than, uh, than we originally had intended. And uh, it would be good to hear your kind of concluding thoughts on the discussion that uh, is about to begin. Uh, without much further ado, I will ask, um, I, again, I, I'm not going to introduce each panelist. Uh, the entire panel is incredibly uh, and, and profoundly well uh, qualified to uh, engage on and, uh, and share their views on a number of aspects of the very important work that Dr. Pasha has done. 
Um, perhaps we can begin with Dr. Abid Suleri. Uh, Abid, uh, the way that I've broken down the questions, as you may have already seen, is, uh, uh, and if I could also request Dr. Pasha, agar mute bhi kar perfect, that's perfect. Okay, so, so um, Dr. Abid Suleri, uh, the panel, which consists of Dr. Abid Suleri, Dr. Sabah Gul Khatak, uh, Dr. Shamshad Akhtar, and Dr. Shitusan, um, fantastic panel and so happy that uh, they're talking about this. Uh, the important work that Dr. Pasha and the UNDP have done in this human development report is tried to frame inequality through these three Ps. And so what I thought we'd do is I'd ask each of the first three panelists um, with Dr. Isha to conclude as the fourth one, but each of the first three panelists about each of the Ps. So uh, maybe starting with you, uh, Abed, you know, you've done so much work, uh, and particularly you've done work on this aspect of uh, power and uh, the consolidation or the accumulation of power in a certain way. Uh, in the past, uh, and including in this report, we've referred to this accumulation or concentration of power as elite capture. Um, maybe just give us a very quick view of your perspective on the nature of elite capture, how it is configured in Pakistan, how you saw the report treating the issue of elite capture, where it broke down some of the key groups that have taken over power in the country and that don't seem to be at any, uh, under any threat of, uh, of having that power corroded or, or reduced. And, and also from a policy perspective, what has been done in the past and what do you see being done currently uh, to counter elite capture and to corrode it or break it down? Dr. Abid Suleri. Uh, I'm going to ask you to wrap up in about five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Musharraf, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fees Pasha, for your uh, excellent work and for uh, setting the scene. Now, I'll just uh, uh, add uh, uh, from where uh, Dr. Pasha uh, stopped. Uh, Dr. Pasha has uh, already uh, given us a broader uh, scenario of uh, this uh, elite capture through power, and uh, he gave us uh, the seven distinct groups. Uh, I'll just uh, dare to add another group uh, here, and that is uh, civilian establishment. So while we discussed uh, uh, corporates, feudal lords, and uh, uh, high income uh, uh, individuals, uh, exporters, military establishment, etc., I think civil, uh, civilian uh, establishment, that is uh, another uh, powerful group that is uh, taking all the uh, privileges. Uh, in uh, the report, of course, uh, uh, most of the things which are mentioned here are uh, pre-COVID. I will just uh, give you some of the examples of uh, uh, this uh, elite capture through power, uh, through uh, making use of loopholes in the system uh, during COVID. So uh, during COVID with excellent uh, intentions, uh, government uh, came up with the turf, uh, uh, the state bank uh, uh, facilitated a highly subsidized credit. Uh, now, if you look at a uh, debt list out of uh, 334 billion rupees, which were provided by state bank uh, to uh, more than uh, uh, 48 uh, sectors, 230 billion rupees goes to textile sector only. And then comes your rest of uh, 47 sectors. And this is state bank's uh, document uh, that we are talking. Similarly, when we are talking of uh, uh, in the uh, federal uh, budget, uh, reduction of uh, duties on uh, uh, motor cars, now just see that how wealth becomes a magnet that pulls that has a, a stronger pull force uh, as uh, you start accumulating that wealth. Uh, none of the automobile assemblers here in Pakistan is running at its 100% production uh, capacity. The maximum they are running is at 60% production capacity. Uh, and despite all good intentions of the government, uh, the consumer, they have to pay premium or on price in order to buy a new car. Uh, according to uh, parkwheel.com, uh, one of uh, the cars, Hyundai, Sonata, if you want to buy it, you have to pay 15% of the value, almost 1 million rupees as a premium. And that is despite the fact that government is trying to facilitate uh, the automobile uh, uh, assembly in Pakistan. So all those who had money, they have actually advanced booked and now they are selling it on premium. Let's uh, come to real estate. Uh, real estate is again a sort of a casino. Uh, government is trying its best to provide mortgage uh, to uh, the low income, uh, earners, uh, government is trying to provide housing, but uh, looking at uh, the trend uh, in uh, real estate market and according to uh, zameen.com, the listed value of uh, DHA phase seven and phase nine over last one year 
In phase seven in Lahore, it has increased by 77%. In phase nine in Lahore, it has increased by 66%. So again, a lot of trading is going on, the purchasing of oil and selling it. And those who wanted to buy, uh, they're still uh, standing in the queue and trying to see uh, how they would be able to make the boat and meet. Uh, I'll come to the third uh, uh, important uh, segment, uh, and that is stock exchange. Uh, you might have seen uh, huge activity in the stock exchange. Uh, the top 25 performers who are giving 100 to 500 uh, percent uh, profit uh, uh, in, in those uh, 25 uh, uh, performers, you will find many non-operational and dysfunctional groups. So the point I'm trying to make that uh, with this collusion, with this elite capture, with this uh, power, uh, those who have wealth, they are actually uh, having a joy ride. And uh, those who uh, don't, uh, they are still standing in the queue. And this is despite the fact that the government, uh, I'm again repeating, uh, have excellent intentions uh, to uh, reduce inequality and to address uh, inequity. Uh, the final point I want to say is about uh, the targeted subsidy. Dr. Sanya Nishtar has uh, uh, very excellently given uh, an overview. Right now, the subsidy that uh, we are uh, providing in the name of uh, uh, poor, uh, the maximum uh, share of it goes to, again, uh, this elite class. Uh, and uh, even the petrol, which is subsidized, uh, you can see that uh, who would be the major beneficiary, a Prado driver or a, a motorbike or a chinky driver. So if we are giving a subsidy on petroleum prices because we want to take care of uh, the uh, lower income earner, uh, just look at the consumption and by virtue of consumption pattern that uh, uh, power capture is there. Uh, I think uh, finally, there is no good policy. There is no bad policy. Uh, there are losers in best policies and there are beneficiaries of the worst policy. All that needs to be done perhaps is to increase the number of beneficiaries for each uh, policy uh, if we really want to address inequality and inequity. And I know that uh, uh, very distinguished panelists who would speak after me uh, they will address on the policy and people aspect of it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Zuley. Before I let you go, I think I, I want to push you on on one point uh, for the benefit of the audience. I think because you know the, we we want to have a, a real uh, debate as well. Just answer for me this: Is the absence of effective policy? Let's remove good and bad, or virtuous and evil, because those are complicated words. But is the absence of effective policy against inequality a function of will? or a function of competence. It sounds to me like you're saying the government had very good intentions, but uh, I don't say Like, and, and I think that that should be challenged and it would be challenged by, by others. And so speaking for many and, and for myself, I, I have trouble with the assertion or the, the attribution of good intent and innocent incompetence. I think if there's real intent, then the competence should be there. So what is your response to that? Dr. Suleri. Well, uh, I would say if you look at the whole definition of uh, uh, this power, it is uh, the group that uh, exploits the loopholes in the system. And those loopholes, those are very much there. So a policy tells you that, okay, uh, there would be mortgages available to the lower income household. Then your commercial banks, uh, they will simply uh, turn down the application submitted by someone who doesn't have a collateral, someone who doesn't have an, an introducer uh, at uh, one pretext or the other pretext. So it's not only policy, it's the policy implementation that is required. And I would say that uh, all of us as a society, we love the state of inertia. Uh, and uh, that is a loophole uh, where uh, that uh, get exploited by the powerful uh, groups and uh, that then leads to elite capture. Thanks, uh, Dr. Saab. Hopefully we can come back to this. Uh, Dr. Sabah Gul uh, the second P uh, for me, uh, you know, power is, is the one we started with. Uh, the second P for me is uh, people. And this report, I think, does such a great job of zeroing in on the identity-based discrimination that is embedded in the Pakistani economy that, that actually effectively means that where you are born and to whom you are born will determine your fate by and large. So, so the question really is, the report at least, and, and Dr. Pasha, Pasha and his colleagues, their research indicates that social mobility is 
is lacking in a very, very substantial way. And it's lacking at a structural and institutional level. It's not just a happenstance of five or six or 10 or 20% of, of the economy or the population. It is the defining feature of the economy and, and society. Uh, how do you feel about that proposition that there is this serious structural lack of social mobility? And what does it do to, to the challenge of tackling inequality, Dr. Sabah Gul Khatak? And again, I would request four to five minutes so we could, you know, I can also maybe ask a follow-up question and then get to Dr. Shamshad Akhtar, Dr. Shutasan, and then eventually come back to Dr. Aziz Pasha. Dr. Sabah Gul Khatak. Sabah? I've lost 10 seconds. Uh That's fine. I wanted to appreciate uh, the report that Dr. Pasha has led. It is music to anyone's ears because we've been seeing a lot of these things, but Dr. Pasha has put it together beautifully, backed with data that many of us could not find, but we used to always feel it in our bones. So, so in that sense, it's refreshing to see that many of the issues that one has debated for two, three decades have finally sort of been proven to be true. And what was most important for me as a researcher was the fact that he was able to show um, factually how uh, necessarily economic growth rates uh, do not help with redistribution. This is something many of us had been saying, but Dr. Pasha has provided proof. Uh, and with this kind of proof, what uh, is important is it will bring back a focus upon uh, fair justice, uh, fairness and justice in, in redistribution. Um, the context of intergenerational inequalities is extremely important. And Musharraf, I think you are referring to that and that that is where the context of geography comes in, as Dr. Pasha's in, um, presentation also indicated. Balochistan is amongst the poorest of provinces today. It was not like this some um, years back, but it has become like this, and we have policy to blame for that. Um, I think Dr. Pasha has indicated that social mobility can take place with the three-pronged strategy that he has proposed, which is reducing privileges. Um, and especially, I think in this case, a redistribution of land should be considered because uh, redistribution of land, either because the agriculture uh, land holdings have become too small and unsustainable or are too large. Um, that needs to be considered as a key for reducing intergenerational inequalities across the different marginalized groups, whether it is women or children or the transgender or people from uh, remote geographic areas. Um, all of that can be addressed uh, fairly well, I'm not saying entirely, but fairly effectively. Uh, and of course, in, in this regard, we have laws, there are loopholes in laws, and then the implementation of laws where institutions are needed, our courts take forever to settle land dis disputes. So, um, uh, and then the data, the importance of data, we must underscore that for any kind of policies to be uh, going in the right direction. Even now, I'm amazed at the kind of data Dr. Hafiz Pasha was able to work with. But when we look at the SDGs, for instance, then there are, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we do so uh, badly on those scores is because we do not have enough data of the 244 indicators we have data for only about 160 and that too at the national level not the district level not sometimes even at the provincial level so so we need to look at that to be able to come up with any kind of policy that is based upon ground realities at the micro data and the micro data can be actually misleading i can give you one small example in gilgit baltistan the data from lfs indicates that women's income sort of outstripped 
men's hourly uh, remuneration over a three or four year period, whereas there was nothing in the social, political, there were no changes in the social and political life of people. There were no policy changes. So how did this happen? And then the explanation comes that comes is the micro data has not, you know, uh, is fairly messed up. So, so, you know, those kinds of issues need to be addressed for us to be able to move forward towards policies that will capture the, the groups that suffer the most. Uh, okay, and, Dr. Khattar, can I, can, can I jump in uh, and maybe, maybe mix this up a little bit? Because oftentimes with, with very high level experts of, of, of your kind and Dr. Suleri and Dr. Akhtar and Dr. Sand, uh, you know, the tendency sometimes is to, for us to be fixated on, on the technocratic aspect of this. Let me try to, let me try to maybe make this less sophisticated. Uh, and and that, that would be my contribution. What, what data are we talking about? What data do we need? Isn't the TLP or the PTM or the anger on the streets, you know, and, and especially in terms of regional inequality, what more data do we need when people are actively and openly challenging the authority of the state, not because they, they can win against the state, but because they're that angry and that frustrated. So I guess maybe I'm asking to, for you to speak a little more on the impact of this inequality on national life in general. Speak to any aspect of it you like, but I do think it's important for us to acknowledge that the data is on the streets, the data is on social media, the data is in our public discourse, anger, rejection of the state, rejection of systems, uh, romance for things like the Taliban, these are all manifestations and data points, are they not? Uh, they are, but for any kind of policy that we have to make, uh, we need to have the backing of actual facts and figures. And Dr. Hafiz's report highlights how even uh, the governments look at the vaccination um, that discriminates. And that is why you see the manifestation on the roads. I think um, the, the kinds of social movements, but at the same time, the kind of oppression many of these movements face is also uh, indicative of what or the direction in which our country is going. While I would avoid looking at what are very, very politically motivated um, uh, movements and the kind of neoconservative and the shrinking of space for many civil society um, organizations, whether that's media houses or development uh, practitioners in the form of NGOs, CBOs. Those are larger questions of democracy that I think the entire region faces, whether it is India, Bangladesh, or others. I think in Pakistan's case, we need to focus in on what is it at the micro level that can be done to address the intergenerational inequalities? I can go in a very different mode, but um, you know the neoliberal policies across the region, so on and so forth, uh, that, that dent democracy and give rise to authoritarianism. And that authoritarianism is not even restricted to our region. It, is, uh, it, is, it was there under Trump. It was there in Europe. It is still there in Europe, whether you look at Hungary or other countries um, you know, across the globe. So, um, but, but I think what is important for our own context is the issue of access to services, access to land, and access to economic opportunities, especially for women. If we look at the informal sector, a majority of the women are in home-based work, 20 million of them. Uh, they, they are not documented. They do not have any access to to rights. And then we come to social protection. I think Sanya gave a very good presentation and they're good initiatives, but how much can social protection move us out of this intergenerational in inequality. It is more of charity approach. We need to have more rights-based approaches. We need to have more voices of the people come in on this. And I think this report captures many of those voices where Dr. Pasha has talked about fatalism, uh, where people are not able to get out of their poverty. So, so just throwing 5,000 rupees or 4,000 rupees a month is not going to solve these issues. I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khadag, and thank you for indulging uh, 
uh, my, my both my questions. Uh, I think the the mention of the neoliberal sort of policies or framework or regime uh, that that you uh, that you did was a really good segue for for my next uh, question uh, and uh, and and the question I wanted to frame for Dr. Shamshad Akhtar. Dr. Akhtar, the you know having uh, you having been the chief regulator uh, for monetary policy uh, and and the governor of the state bank and then having various interactions with the state including as caretaker finance minister um and and including in your current role where you're doing i, I think a lot for the state that the state should have been doing many years ago through garandas uh, i i wanted to ask whether it is realistic for us to even be having this discussion because it, it seems to me that the entire basis of so much of what we're talking about demands a dismantling of the existing state structures. And this is not a Pakistan problem. This is a global problem. Uh, Michael Lewis has written about this in great detail with respect to the US system. We've seen through Brexit and through the rise of various populist movements in many countries across the world that there is a growing frustration with the failure of the existing structure, this kind of Westphalian neoliberal structure. Are, am I being too dark? Is this too extreme? And is there a way that we can retain this structure and also achieve some progress, some progress, any progress on the inequality benchmark, uh, taking our cues from Dr. Pasha's report and, and, his, and, and the work that you, uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, Abid Suleri, Sabah Gulkhatak, and so many others have done over the last few decades. Dr. Akhtar. So, assalamu alaikum, and uh, my compliments to Hafiz Pasha staff, as well as the UNDP. Thank you. Together. It is an outstanding account uh, of all dimensions, estimation, both as well as all the other dynamics of inequality. Um, I have to say that um, uh, regarding your question, of course, there are lots of complications um, uh, on uh, regarding inequality. But let me uh, focus very much um, on trying to reiterate a little bit of the message which uh, Hafiz Pasha Saab uh, brought out and some others have brought out, that inequality, in my view, is a very notorious phenomenon. And it is a very challenging concept. Uh, no one size fits can apply to it. Um, and I will go into that a little bit. Um, but as you have pointed out, and Afiz Pasha Saab, as well as Abid has pointed out, that it is actually driven by state capture of the feudal industry tycoons, the real, realtors. And I have seen that startling now, coming back to Pakistan uh, and having been here now for five years. It is very obvious that everyone is tempering with the policies and regulations or destroying what was a good policy. We did all this work in um, 1980s when I was at the World Bank. We did all the public financial management uh, revamping. We did the tax reforms uh, revamping everything. Um, sorry, my video seems to have gone, so I got your message. So, um, Habiz Pasha was with me at that time, and he did part of the work along with a lot of other people. So, you know, we have done all this work, but what happens at the end of the day is the interference of the vested interests and attempt uh, to divert funds, um, investments, um, and funds uh, from what should be a proper development agenda uh, to actually financing uh, industry and trade protectionism, offering outright subsidies, tax exemptions, concessions, and tolerating tax evasion and avoidance, in my view, has reached a proportion that it should be subject to penalties. It is a loss of state resources, right and left. So tackling um, in inequality, whether in Pakistan or Asia Pacific, where I put in the last four years before coming to Pakistan, is a complex endeavor. I can tell you examples from India, uh, China, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I have learned, and this is to answer your question, that of course, one approach is 
uh, to go for a revolution when you have such a um, disastrous <laughs> uh, kind of um, uh, approach uh, to promoting equality. You get so fed up uh, every day when you are looking at the policy aspect that you almost feel like, you know, I, I need to really start a revolution. And as you know, uh, when I was um, in Middle East and North Africa, Vice President, uh, during my term there, we had a revolution. And that revolution was people's revolution, the Arab Spring. Whether it was dictatorial regime of um, um, Tunisia, Egypt, all of them lost their hold. It was decades uh, of dictatorial regime that crumbled in minutes when the uh, spring, Arab Spring uh, sprouted. So, my, you know, that is one approach uh, when you are uh, uh, raising this question. But building back uh, takes a lot of time. Of course, you have to dismantle every corruption um, if that of the state leaders, as it has happened uh, in case of Egypt, Tunisia, uh, the kind of looting of, um, of the national wealth that occurred in Middle East and North Africa wealth uh, was inexcusable. And I'm sure if we left um, uh, Hafiz Pasha Saab and myself alone for, for another few years, I'm sure we'll be able to dig out the looting of the state's wealth also that has happened because of the political economy that exists in this country. So but how, how, what is the second milder response that we have? Or what you have just now pointed out, you don't want technical response, but I do think technical response is possible to go for. And I'm going to touch on technical response, which is supposed to be my basic uh, intervention. So we do know inequality is a complex endeavor. It would require a coherent, consistent, and well-coordinated policy architecture and a collaborative whole of government and system approach. It can't happen that the Ministry of Petroleum is trying to go for certain subsidies and um, another uh, right and left of it is trying to uh, go for investments that are inefficient in the refinery or whatever. So you need, um, we need, a drive in that is pushing for inclusive, broad-based, balanced and sustainable growth and development that has potential to be distributed efficiently, effectively and fairly across society and create opportunities for all. It is doable. It's just that we don't want to go through the pain of designing this because there is a lot of um, uh, dismantling of the vested interests on the way we have to remove incompetent um, uh, government officials, uh, politicians from the whole uh, environment. Now, the second point is fiscal policy, in my view, has the most potential to serve as the primary tool to drive redistribution through, of course, progressive taxes uh, rather than regressive taxes, which is uh, the form that we have. Uh, and regressive taxes, as we know, hurt consumption of poor. And public expenditure, that is by policy design, uh, is pushing for efficiency. And we need to push for pre distribution, not post distribution. I mean, and all our responses, we say we are pursuing, going to pursue inclusive growth. So we don't go for uh, pre distribution. We go for post distribution, and that means post distribution of fiscal um, tools, and that will not work. That that's a half-hearted attempt. It's a uh, it's basically an ad hoc approach, uh, and we really need to. I once talked to a minister and said we need a rules-based approach to fiscal policy, and all I got was cynicism that that doesn't work in Pakistan because we distribute the pie in and dissect it to individuals rather than to a society, which is what we should be doing. So we need distribu redistribution through progressive taxes rather than regressive taxes. 
we need to actually be providing public goods that are correcting the market failure and there is abundance of that but that doesn't mean setting up more state owned enterprises i am right now uh, chair of the sui southern gas company and i can tell you there is a huge exploitation by the elite of the gas resources that are being uh, transferred to them nobody wants to say there is a theft but that's a culture and there are very important people who are protecting them all so combination of the policies um, also requires that we need to fiscally integrate spending for social services adequately adequately provision for education health nutrition youth all these categories of people that was being talked about um we have to make sure that a combination of these policies allow for redistributing larger envelopes of revenue in a fair just and democratically approved manner so distributive objectives ought to be fiscalized based on agreed short and long term objectives to ensure we are go seeking shared prosperity consistent of course with fiscal sustainability my last two points that i'd like to make is that of course i could bring in more technocratic stuff but as i was told not to do that i have to really talk about one important point where i think of these fans and i have both worked together at different points in time which is trying to develop of course upfront consensus and agreement which is a prerequisite for launching a, a really significant move from population centric distribution criteria of federal transfers to provincial div divisible pool as it has done more disservice by promoting unabated population growth to adoption of course of eventually a composite formula and mechanism that offers revenue transfer for sustainable finance revenue transfer for climate finance to encourage climate neutrality of infrastructure and greening of our urban centers we have been evading and avoiding this there is no talk in pakistan of trying to address the issue of vulnerability of the climate so to ensure enhancement of matching um, local um, uh, government funds best uh, to institute urban property and agriculture uh, taxes which have enjoyed huge uh, for years and decades um uh, complete tax holiday um and we need to stop encroachment to foster food security and this is very important for human development the united nations is launching a massive endeavor to promote food security it's such a complex subject um but it is food security is threatened by a range of malpractices including in efficient use of time of land which is doing nothing but adding to the emission on our part of the geography so i do respect what um, sania has launched and done uh, it's huge and karandas has played uh, its due role in this uh, to make sure that we are uh, promoting digital financial inclusion for the program she uh, the government is promoting but my own experience has taught me something else pakistan has a lot to draw from the proliferation of new tested um conditional cash transfer program that link family benefits to the number of children and condition continued eligibility on attendance of children at health clinics and schools you know having non conditional transfer is like throwing money in the ocean uh because it is not going to change the life and livelihood it's not going to um eventually uh, change the destiny of the people that are enjoying the advantage so everywhere in latin america and some of these countries everybody talked about 
uh, including Indonesia, we promoted uh, conditional cash transfer. And there are other technicalities to it, but since you asked me not to, I'm not going to. So the redistribution program has to be integrated and crystallized, um, and they have to be scaled down, um, uh, scaled up, um, but we have to really ultimately um, figure out what is fiscally uh, financeable because our fiscal deficit is quite high. Uh, our fiscal, the cost of the universal price subsidies and everything else that Reef Pasha has mentioned has to be accounted for. Let me, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Saiba. Let me take that, uh, that dynamic of uh, the fiscal imbalance that, that this country suffers from perennially and almost, I would say, permanently. Uh, you and Dr. Pasha and other friends on the panel have had uh, much more experience than myself, but for over two and a half decades, I've uh, grappled with this and, and uh, others have grappled with this for five decades, six decades, a country for seven and a half. Dr. Abid Suleri, maybe you can help us on this because on the one hand, we don't have progressive taxation, we have uh, regressive taxation, but on the other, uh, we also have, and I think Dr. Pasha has uh, laid this out beautifully in the report, we have what might be called regressive subsidies. So it's not just that the poor are being punished for being poor, but the rich are being rewarded for being rich by, by, by giving, giving them a chance to expand their, their wealth. That wealth is what is driving. If I've understood Dr. Pasha's work correctly and the UNDP uh, National Human Development Report 2020 correctly, that extra wealth, that constantly growing wealth is ensuring further capture of the state by the elite. All of the fiscal policies and, and the, the very sensible things that Dr. Uh, Akhtar has talked about, that you've talked about, not just in this conversation, uh, Abid, but throughout your career, which I've followed intently and closely, everything that Dr. Sabah Gul Khatak has done, all of those conversations, they die on arrival. And the reason they die on arrival, if we are to take the framework proposed by this report, is because we are proposing things to people who don't need to listen to us because they own the policy architecture, the, thir the third P. Abid, how do you, how do you deal with that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also what advice do you give to younger people that are signed up to this uh, conversation and are listening and they're looking for hope and for direction in terms of how this will be solved? something that hasn't been solved for two or three or four decades. How's it going to get solved tomorrow? Abit? Yes, uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Musharraf. And uh, Dr. Fees Pasha in his second P, uh, People, uh, he has explained uh, people uh, uh, beautifully. Uh, it is the belief system and it is the acceptance of uh, uh, the status quo. So all the things that uh, uh, Dr. Shamshad, Dr. Dr. Sabah Gul Khatak and uh, other uh, distinguished panelists, they have uh, 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 elaborated upon, uh, somehow uh, it is accepted uh, by society, by the belief system, and uh, either it is taken for granted or either it is uh, taken uh, that uh, this is how the system would run, or uh, we can't change the uh, system, uh, yes, uh, uh, because of uh, their elite uh, capture, because of their power, uh, they are eligible or they are able to uh, gather maximum benefit from states, whether it's in uh, access to uh, uh, social services or whether it's subsidy, uh, etc. And uh, I think that status quo needs to be broken and that uh, system needs to be challenged. If we stop uh, uh, questioning, that means we are endorsing uh, the system which is chronically uh, eroding uh, not only uh, the benefit getting passed uh, uh, to uh, the lowest two quantile, but uh, further re-endorsing uh, elite capture. So raising this issue, questioning it. And I think the youngsters, they can uh, uh, play a fantastic role uh, in asking questions and in uh, challenging uh, the status quo and this belief thanks. system. Th thanks, uh, thanks, Doc. Uh, let me take that very thought to Dr. Sabagul Khatak and, and uh, Dr. Khatak very quickly. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, I, I wanted to frame this question earlier for Abid, but I think you're a better candidate for this. Abid, in his, in his initial intervention, he listed all these things where people are making money. And it almost sounds like in this conversation, making money and social mobility is the problem. 
that if there are people that go from right, riding a motorcycle to riding a Prado, uh, real estate agents, that somehow that is a manifestation of elite capture. That if somebody invests 100,000 rupees in the stock market and ends up making a crore rupees, that that is somehow a manifestation of elite capture. At a macro level, may, maybe that's right. Maybe, maybe those things are just uh, manifestations of some kind of elite capture, but there is some social mobility in this country, is there not? When we see car sales go through the roof, when we see uh, more people buy more property, when we see Naya Pakistan Housing Development Authority, and we see a whole range of instruments, not just at the lowest end of the spectrum with the SAS emergency cash, but with so many other, especially in the middle and upper middle class, we see a lot of growth. Then maybe our notions of equality need to be adjusted with the idea that maybe there is some social mobility and that rather than diminishing that social mobility, we want to increase that quantum for the, the lower quintiles. Uh, or am I getting this all wrong? Is that too supply side economics and too kind to the uh, real estate mafias and the stock exchange mafias? And we should just eliminate anybody having any chance at making money. Dr. Sabah Gulkhata. Thanks. Um, Musharraf, I think social mobility uh, happens because of social change, which is a slow process, but it does take place. And so even in the context of intergenerational inequality, what one's parents could afford is today, you know, there's some difference and improvement um, you know, I've seen it in over my own life cycle. So yes, some of that is possible. I think what is most important for social mobility is the issue of voice. Um, for, for people to feel that they have a voice that can reach uh, other people and those in power. Uh, and that happened, if I can give you one or two small examples, of uh, when there were quotas instituted in local government for women. You saw uh, initially there was a lot of skepticism, but then a lot of women came through that whole process of having quotas in local government where women had a voice. They could decide whether there should be a tube well uh, in a or a certain street should be paved at that tehsil or union council level. So, so that, that, that issue of voice, and I think that also gave many other women this um, hope and confidence that they could also come into the public sector and ensure something happens at that mohalla level. Uh, the other issue I can uh, issue, not issue, but uh, example that I can give you is that of home-based workers. I've been working on home-based workers for the last maybe 25 years. Um, and I felt it was all gloom and doom. But um, I find that today home-based workers have formed their own unions and there is also a federation. There are provincial unions of home-based workers. So yes, once they have a voice, they can then push for their agenda. And I think that is the most important point. Um, I, and you know, yes, income mobility is there, but the issue of voice needs to accompany that. Sure, I, I mean, this could really open up uh, and, and because I have instructions to wrap this up very quickly, um, but I do think it's fair that I'm gonna say something, I'll give you a chance to respond, which is that uh, your advocacy of the uh, women's participation and the quota, uh, quotas in the local government, uh, of course, the only thing I'm reminded of is the local government ordinance 2001, the Musharraf era, reforms that created the Anjuman Musaliha, the Insaf committees, the citizen community boards, and that's where we had women participation. Is that an indication, Sabah, of, of you having uh, revisited your, your uh, lack of support for the Musharraf era? Or is that just a reality that sometimes even dictators can produce reasonable outcomes in terms of policy? Can I come in and just make one observation? You had said that you might give me an opportunity to sum up. I Is will. That going to happen. Okay. Absolutely. One hundred percent, Dr. Sab. G. Sabah. Um, uh, Musharraf, it doesn't make me change my mind about support for 
<laughs> an authoritarian government. All I'm saying is there was a policy. It is an inconvenient fact that in our country, dictatorships have also, you know, not always been anti uh, women. It's a very inconvenient fact, but it is there. Um, the, the point is here was a policy that did yield results for women. That's all. But it will not make me support of course. authoritarian. Of course. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't want to make that point without giving you a chance to to explain that. Thanks, uh, Dr. Khatak. Uh, Dr. Akhtar, uh, uh, a very quick sort of response to, uh, I guess I want to double down on my original question. Um, you know, I deliberately use the term dismantling. Let me, let me use a less uh, maybe provocative term and say, the names and assignments of the federal ministries, the quantum of talent available to the different civil service occupational groups, the means of recruiting and retaining talent in the government of Pakistan. Do any of those three things indicate that without substantial, deliberate, and bold reforms, any of the things that you've talked about throughout your career, but especially today, are actually reasonable or likely? Well, um, I don't want to uh, do any disservice to my colleagues in the government or the politicians in power right now. Um, I have to still work with them. <laughs> uh, but this is best uh, uh, posed to, um, uh, to Isha Saab, who has a deeper understanding of how, how the internal mechanics have, have worked in the last few years. But when I was there, uh, I can tell you, and this is my main message in conclusion, that we have not been able to figure out what should be a public policy response to inequality or poverty? Because we get these massive loans from the World Bank and IMF, and they provide us um, FX reserves, uh, and the rupee resources go to finance the budget. And how the budget utilizes the, the funding, everybody knows, so I don't need to sweat on it. But I do feel that the bold step would be that we step back. They have constituted several uh, uh, groups, uh, economic advisory groups, and um, Abed has more experience on them than I, but Pakistan actually today, on the heels of COVID-19, whose after effects are going to per persist for some time, and it's going to hurt our poor more, it's swelling the ranks of the poor, inequalities are growing because today, who's making the money? All the industries are running at 20, 30 <laughs> percent uh, profit. So uh, it's not the poor people who are getting the money. So we need a new social contract. That's what happened during Arab Spring, but the politicians messed it up. We had put together a new social contract. And this new, new social contract is being advocated now. Um, books have been written on it. We have to really take a strong position to discontinue all subsidies, all wasteful tax concessions and incentives, all mispricing of the state-owned utilities that are financially compounding SOE's losses we, and eroding their profitability. We have to go beyond plain vanilla social safety net that offer unconditional transfers of income. And we should lay the foundation for what I said, free distribution mechanism, fiscally integrated in fiscal free distribution, not forced distribution after the fiscal policy. And it should target funding for sustainable development goals. It should offer security to aged by moving to pay as from the pay-as-you-go pension system, uh, which is unfunded uh, and unviable to pension system, that has to be funded from the multilateral funding, which is going to different direction and there's no accountability. Free distribution mechanism should incorporate gender budgeting, which is what Saba would love, I'm sure, but it has to be done rightly that allows for equity in gender education, health services, and it should 
allow for provisions for gender equality across the sector. It ought to target the root causes of income inequality by promoting outcomes, opportunities, and access to services for people because growth will be dampened more and more by income inequality. There's massive evidence on that. Sure. So if we think we are embarked on growth by all these um, goodies that we have provided to the elite, uh, I can tell you we are going to again uh, go through another cycle of twin deficits and not get any sure. Thank sure. you for we're giving. already headed. We're already headed that way, Doctor. That, that's that's very clear. Uh, thank you uh, for for indulging, uh, Doctor Sabah Gulkhata, Doctor Abid Suleri, Doctor Shamshad Akhtar. I apologize on behalf of Doctor Ishit Hussain, who was not able to join us. Doctor Fees Pasha, with again with se severe and sincere apologies for asking. Uh, for your presentation to be wrapped up much more quickly than we would have liked. Uh, but, but I did want to give you the floor and ask you to maybe uh, share your reflections on this conversation, but, but maybe also to frame that in, in the context of what I've tried to do in this conversation, which is really to, to question whether or not the baseline assumptions of Cetris Paribus they may be amenable and, and uh, it, may, it, may, uh, it may enable us to engage uh, the powers that be uh, more effectively, but the, the powers that be themselves, I think, are as frustrated as some of us. Uh, I can tell you on the record, Dr. Uh, Pasha, that the, at that time, the finance minister and the current planning minister, there is no individual on the planet that he admires more than you. Uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, wisdom and understanding. By the way, the, the similar was the case with the previous government. When we have governments, one after the other after the other, whose prime ministers, planning ministers, finance ministers, listen intently and respect you like they respect their fathers, like it is an intense level of respect that they have for you, Dr. Pasha. And yet when it comes to execution of policy, the distance between what you are saying and what they're doing is night and day. It, it was 10 years ago, it was five years ago, and it has been over the last two and a half years. This gap is really, to me, the most fascinating of all gaps. It means that PMLN is not evil, PPP is not evil, PTI is not evil, GHQ is not evil. All of them want to do everything that Dr. Pasha says, and all of them consistently keep failing. Explain to me, because I'm sure you have some insights on this, why they're failing to execute the vision that you've articulated throughout your career, but particularly in this very, very important document that we talked about today, Dr. Fees Pasha. Thank you. Thank you. I must say that we've had an extraordinarily rich and enlightened discussion, and I'm extraordinarily grateful to our participants. They have made very major contributions to this whole discussion and debate on the inequality issues. <clears throat> I'll come to the question that you framed at the very end and, and indicate to you what may be happening. First, <clears throat> you see, among the different vested interests that we had identified, uh, Dr. Soleri rightly uh, identified the civilian establishment as a group which we did not adequately focus on. Actually, if you look at the employment uh, figures, 95% of the employment in the so-called civilian establishment is in the so-called attached departments and autonomous bodies. The secretariat is only 5%. And these are mostly the state-owned enterprises. So we have covered it. And in fact, there's a sentence there which says that uh, um, the, the land access issue is there with the bureaucracy, but only with the higher echelons of the bureaucracy. But in terms of size, it's a relatively small uh, ratio compared to, you know, other, other uh, Western interests which have access to land. Another very important point has been made about social mobility. And to what extent will that and introduce a degree of uh, greater equality. It's very interesting that one of the methodological breakthroughs of this report is the development of a new inequality measure never developed before in the world. And I'm proud to say that this is spark breaking. 
This is the Pashung Index. And for the first time, the middle class has been brought into measuring inequality. By and large, the emphasis has been on the top versus the bottom. You know, the research that we did on the middle class of Pakistan is extremely worrying. It's not just that the poor are getting dispossessed, but over the last 15 years, there has been a significant squeezing of the middle class of Pakistan. In a way, we should speak at the, at the middle of the Musharraf era. But thereafter, the middle class has been really hopelessly squeezed. And today, our latest estimates are that from about 40% uh, to about 15 years ago, now it is down to less than 30% of the population. And it's based on an international definition of the middle class. So the middle class is not providing the puff buffer. It is not providing the leadership, which one expects more from an enlightened middle class. I and mean, this, a lot of the time, the bourgeois movement tends to emerge from the lower echelons of the middle class. And in Pakistan, we thought we saw a little bit of this in the initial movement of the Tariq in Saf, when the urban middle class was very much on board with the platform of the party. Unfortunately, not much change has occurred since then. On the intergenerational issues, you see, land reform was, was a burning subject at the time of uh, the 70s, soon after we lost East Pakistan, and we had the brand called Islamic Socialism. But it died a natural death thereafter. And unfortunately, today, 50% of our farmers own less than two and a half acres and 22% of the land is owned by 1%. And in fact, there has been consolidation. Fragmentation is not taking place. The mechanization process and the ability to hire and subcontract has increased. And what we are seeing is a rise in inequality within the rural domain, agriculture. So of course, one could talk in terms, but really that would mean fundamentally tackling one of the most powerful elites in this country. My own suggestion, which is somewhat less radical, has been that, please, can we have the semblance of an inheritance tax? I know it's interesting that uh, under Erdogan's leadership in Turkey, they have introduced a significant inheritance tax. And maybe that will be a very direct way of beginning to counter some of the intergenerational inequality issues. And let me concur entirely with Shamsad, the primary instrument for tackling inequality will be and has always been fiscal policy, fiscal policy. Absolutely right. OK. One of the interesting new dimensions of our government's thinking is what is reflected in this budget. And I must say, I found it refreshing. The talk of a bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down approach and the intention thereof of our finance minister to ensure that a much larger share of bank credit is given to the lower segments of the population. Believe me, if this begins to happen, Today, the share example of SMEs, there are over 3 million SMEs in Pakistan, in credit is hardly 6%. If this can be increased to say 12% or 15%, and individual financing goes up from 2 or 3% to 10%, including housing finance, believe me, believe me, this would be a major, major step forward. But trust IMF to have come in and already started saying, that this is not feasible and not acceptable. So you see what, what will happen. Uh, we have a, uh, what I call a Dabang finance minister. I hope he will be able to ensure this bottom up approach is a wonderful new idea, new initiative. Inshallah, inshallah, it should start going through. Finally, you know, you'll be amazed uh, with us. Some of the most privileged sections of the establishment and I will not name them, or the power structure, have asked me to design what they call 
a new social contract. You know, there is little bit of a growing sense that maybe the inequality process has gone too far. And if we are to prevent a semblance of uh, a rise like the Arab Spring, particularly given that we have 6 million youth who are idle in Pakistan, male youth, who have little, little to lose if they participate in the Arab Spring and only to gain. Interestingly, there is talk of self of a kind of enlightened self-interest, which is beginning to creep into the minds of the power structure. And this, to me, again, is a new development. And I'm pleased to report to you that I have just finished a book on Charter of Economy, 340 pages of work that I've done after finishing the Human Development Report. And this was on the request by some of the leading political figures in this country. So inshallah, 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 bottom-up approach, some sense of need to share, to prevent a collapse of the system in the elite. These are the beginnings, I would say, only of signs of positive change. I conclude by praying to Allah, please, God, Please, God, let there be a fairer and more equitable Pakistan of the type that the Prime Minister calls the land of Medina. Allah kare aisa ho jai. Thank you, everybody, for having given so much time and attention to our report. And once again, I want to thank my team for having done extremely good work and for UNDP for having supported our efforts at this. We have been under some pressure from some sources, but we have still managed to produce this report. And thank you, Muddhar, for doing a stellar job as the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pasha. Uh, with that, we, we come to the end. Uh, I'm grateful for the work that you've been doing and have done with this report. And inshallah, you'll continue to do and anticipate, like I'm sure I speak for everyone, that we eagerly anticipate reading uh, this vital, uh, vitally important magnus opus, inshallah, uh, that, that you produced. And of course, I uh, resonate, uh, your, your prayer and your dua resonates with me as it will with millions of Pakistanis. Uh, we all share in that prayer with you. Uh, finally, uh, I would hand over the, 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 the mic and the stage to Knut, um, who as the, uh, as the resident representative and, uh, and in many ways, the person that's responsible for continuing to drive this conversation forward. Uh, Kunut, thank you for the opportunity to engage with this fantastic panel. Uh, thank you for supporting the excellent work that Dr. Pasha has done. And uh, we hope you'll continue to do this work and drive this conversation forward. Over to you, Kunut. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not add, uh, try to add much to this because uh, uh, I think I cannot measure up to the, uh, the uh, competence and the insights that uh, the distinguished speakers and panelists have shared with us today. Um, but let me say two things. Uh, one is, um, I think the, the small observation I want to make on the substance is that it's, it makes it, uh, discussion makes it uh, very clear that these three P's of uh, of the uh, inequality really go together. We were supposed to talk today about policy uh, mainly, but clearly uh, policy cannot live alone. It has to do with people, the people dimension we were talking about in the, in the report on how certain groups in societies are, are, are seen, how what expectations are, what attitudes are, uh, do play a role in how uh, groups can use their opportunities or can I get access to opportunities? The, uh, the power part, how elite capture uh, plays an important role and how elites will, uh, will have an opportunity to do that. Also with other policies, policies cannot be um, solve everything uh, for, uh, for, for the power dimensions too. But policy is the, the key tool that government has available to it to start moving these issues. And, and the report is making some, some key uh, recommendations on policies. 
and the discussion today did touch upon that. And, uh, and that brings me to my second point, is that uh, reflecting on, uh, I think, something that Dr. Nishtar said at, uh, at the beginning, that uh, what we're trying to do here is that the research doesn't end the job, that the research gives, opens up for a discussion, and that the discussion today, the previous discussion we had, the, the next discussion we will have on the power dimension, uh, and, and also even much, even more importantly, the discussions that uh, the participants and others will have among themselves, among others, in other groups, based on these observations, these thoughts that we were trying to open up with this report. And I, 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 I trust and I hope that this, uh, these discussions will give, give room for a new way of thinking on some of these issues. And I thank you so much for contributing to that. Thank you very much. Thank you.